Yeah. So uh, can I start, Amit? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome. On behalf of my entire team of Merck, I, Dr. Someshwar Raisam, welcome you all for the scientific webinar by Merck. So this event is uh, lively broadcasted from Kolkata and also Pan India. So welcome all the participants who have joined from Kerala, Kolkata, and Pan India. So today we have uh, a very special guest. So we are joined by Dr. Robert Fisher from Germany, who would be our speaker for the day. And he would be delivering lecture on the topic of severe effect deficiency in ART and management options. And we have also been joined by Dr. Jay Krishnan from Kerala. He would be our honorable chairperson for the day. So without any further delay, I'd like to welcome, introduce our honorable chairperson for the day, Dr. K. Jay Krishnan, sir. Dr. K.J. Krishna is a director and a chief consultant at Reportive Medicine Unit at KJK Hospital Thiruvananthapuram, Kerala. He has, he has uh, more than 37 years of experience in treating subpartial patients and he has 12 years experience in uh, medical college and 25 years of experience in private setup and he has performed more than 14,000 procedures of endoscopy in the last 21 years and he has performed more than 5,000 cycles in ART. Dr. Jay Krishnan has certified publications in national journals, certified publications in international global journals, and he was a winner of RKK Thampan Award in 83 at AKCOG Kerala, and he has also been awarded by a Foxy Korean Award by AOCOG in 1996. Dr. Jay Krishnan has trained more than 245 trainings in laparoscopy and hysteroscopy in the 21 years, and his collaboration involved two clinical trials internationally, that is PALO study and MSD study. He also contributed chapters in 17 textbooks. Dr. Jay Krishnan has published five books, which included Practical Insights into Infertility Management, Insights into Infertility Management, second edition on updates on fertility management and two biopics, one in Malayalam and one in English on the joys and sorrows of childless couples, respectively. He has uh, more than 30 publications in various journals and is a, a regular, uh, uh, he, he, he regularly conducts advanced international conference and has been a chairperson for the Congress for the past 19 years. So with this, uh, I welcome Dr. Jay Krishna on the stage and I request him to kindly set the context and welcome our speaker. Over to, you, over to you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasant duty to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Fisher. as uh, the founder and medical director of the Fertility Center Hamburg, one of the largest and leading uh, German fertility institutes. He was the medical director of the first IVF unit in Hamburg. In 1998, the Fertility Center Hamburg was one of the first centers to introduce certified quality management according to ISO uh, 2001. And uh, IVF lab was also ISO certified. Robert Fisher is an author of numerous publications in national and international scientific journals and books, <coughs> as well as lectures and conferences worldwide. He's an active member of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine and the founder member of the European Society of Human Reproduction. He's a member of the scientific committee of the Eximit uh, and uh, he's a founding member of Osidon Group and scientific director <coughs> of MEDE. I would like to welcome Dr. Robert Fisher for his talk on FSH and LH uh, deficiency during ovarian stimulation and we'd like to hear from him. Thank you, Professor, for the uh, kind introduction and a uh, very warm uh, hello to you all here from Hamburg. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, although I uh, regret not being face-to-face uh, -face, uh, in, uh, in India with you today. Uh, due to the pandemic situation, of course, we cannot travel as we used to travel in the past. But uh, still, I do thank uh, the Mac company uh, helping us to build up um, meetings like this one uh, so we can uh, exchange uh, 
um, our information and our um, uh, experience uh, together. So the topic uh, I was asked to discuss with you was severe LH and FSH deficiency in ART and its management. This is just a general disclaimer. So the topic uh, I was asked to discuss Hello? Meet the Moral 11, the video editor that can do more. Yeah, Professor, we can hear you. Maybe from, from Kerala. Yeah, I think it's muted now. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they should mute, they should mute themselves because it's uh, echoing back. Yes, yes, Professor. They, they, they muted themselves. Please go. Okay. So I'm just continue now. So, uh, you know, it's a fundamental biological uh, fact that we have two gonadotropins at work in almost all animals and humans. And we know now they, that they do have different functions and different regulation in the follicular development in the luteal phase. Uh, just to give you a general overview, which I'm sure you all know about it. Uh, here you can see the axis between the hypothalamus, pituitary, ovary, LH, ovarian production, and estradiol production. And uh, <clears throat> Basically, we can say that FSH is important at the beginning of the follicular development. And as you can see in the natural cycle, the level of FSH is high at the beginning of cycle because it's important to, for the recruitment of the follicle and also for the initial growth of the follicle. When the lead follicle will arrive around 10 millimeter, you will see a drop in the FSH and LH starts slowly to rise. The reason is now that granulosa cells uh, start uh, to have um, uh, as well uh, LH um, uh, receptors. So LH is becoming more and more important because now it's reaching competence uh, uh, of the oocyte and the follicle and uh, more and more uh, receptors uh, will be now LH receptors and less and less receptors on the granulosa cells will be FSH receptors. So we can say uh, to summarize that FSH is important for the growth of the follicle, LH is important in the second half uh, for uh, uh, reaching competence uh, of the follicle and the oocyte. When we watch from this point, when uh, the 10 millimeters is uh, uh, overdone uh, by the growing follicle and becoming dominant, you will have from this point until the LH will surge, usually five days in the natural cycles. And this is important also for us in a stimulation cycle to consider this time to allow the LH uh, to uh, reach the competence of the oocytes. And the competence is not only a nuclear competence, so it's not just a metaphase two, it also needs to reach the cytoplasmic and the molecular competence of the oocyte. Now, LH is also important in the beginning of the cycle. As I told you, FSH is important uh, for the growth in the beginning uh, because the granulosa cells will have predominantly FSH uh, uh, receptors. Uh, but uh, the Tika cells uh, will have all the time LH receptors. And in the Tika cells, androgen production is going on. The androgens will enter the granulosa cells to be converted into estradiol. But the androgens also will increase the sensitivity of the FSH receptors in the granulosa cells to FSH. So uh, we have an indirect uh, action um, uh, mediated by the androgens of LH on the granulosa cells also in the beginning uh, of the stimulation uh, and the follicular growth. So this is important to remember because uh, if you want to use later on, and I will come to, to back to it later, LH and stimulation protocol, you need the LH from the beginning of the cycle. As you can see, LH is important uh, also in this time via the androgen production. Now, the number of the oocytes uh, in the stimulation protocols is important and is a positive um, factor of increasing the probability of having a pregnancy in the live birth. Now, as you know, FSH uh, has uh, a different uh, <clears throat> 
isoforms. And um, some of them are, are more acidic and some of them are more basic. The more acidic ones uh, have a half life time, which is longer, by, uh, but the bioactivity, which is shorter, and uh, vice versa in the basic form. Now, during the, uh, the cycle, uh, in the natural cycle, uh, it is changing from acidic to more basic. And also during uh, advanced maternal age, the isoforms uh, of the FSH uh, will change. But uh, the different uh, isoform have also specific activity, which is different. And the high specific activity, which is uh, the biological uh, activity uh, by malignant protein is with folytropin alpha. So if you want to have a high number of uh, oocyte in your stimulation, it is recommended to use folytropin alpha. But even in the folytropin alpha, we can have uh, now a more advanced situation because the product that we have today uh, is um, uh, filled by mass and not calibrated by bioassay as it used to be in the past. Calibrated by bioassay of the product uh, will give a difference uh, of plus minus 20%, which is a lot. So if you have 75 units, you will not know if you will have 20% uh, uh, more or 20% less. Uh, calibrated uh, by mass uh, gives us a very accurate uh, um, difference of only 2%. Uh, between uh, the two uh, uh, lots uh, that uh, you will have. And here you can see um, a study that was uh, performed some years ago, comparing the um, uh, filled by uh, bioassay and filled by mass. And you can see that the difference between the different lots is uh, very small. And this is imp important because it will reduce the variability of the number of the oocytes that you will have at the end of the day. So the products that we have today for folytropin alpha filled by mass uh, should be actually the gold standard uh, for uh, using for stimulation protocols. Now, it's not only the FSH, but also the LH will have different isoforms and it will have different isoform during the cycle. And it will have also different isoform in advanced maternal age compared to the younger in advanced maternal age, uh, the isoforms are uh, less um, uh, potent and less bioactive. On the other hand, we also have polymorphisms, also for the LH or the FSH molecule, the so-called beta variants of the molecule, which again have a short half-life time, but uh, a very low bioactivity. And uh, also the FSH and the LH receptors are important uh, because uh, as you can see, there are polymorphisms uh, that can be in this uh, FSH and LH receptors, which can affect our stimulation uh, protocol and uh, the bioactivity of the FSH and LH molecule. Now, the definition of uh, low LH and low FSH or severe low LH and low FSH was already described in, by ICMAT in 2017. And the definition was that if you have a gonadal failure associated with reduced gametogenesis and reduced gonadal steroid production due to reduced gonadotropin production or action. What does it mean? It means that you will have either less production of the gonadotropin itself, or you have a normal amount of gonadotropins, but the action may be due to uh, different uh, isoforms or different polymorphism of the FSH and LH, or the receptors, the action is not adequate. So all this will cause you a deficiency actually uh, in uh, LH and FSH uh, activity and will arrest your follicular development, which you will see in stagnation or suboptimal follicular development and estradiol levels. So as you all 
are aware of. We have a negative and positive feedback in uh, this axis uh, between the hypothalamus pituitary ovary. And uh, we have negative and we have positive feedbacks, but we have all kinds of situations which can affect and interrupt these feedbacks and, and cause, uh, again, a deficiency in the production or the action of FSH and LH. And here you can see just a list of some of the situations. But generally, we can say that congenital or acquired or functional situation might affect uh, this uh, situation here. So congenital deficiency will uh, be, for example, the uh, patients with the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, the hypo-hypo patient, but also patients with LH and FSH molecule polymorphism or LH and FSH receptor polymorphism. Now, acquired deficiency can be either iatrogenic, uh, just by using the analogs or some other drugs uh, will uh, cause uh, LH and FSH deficiency. And I will come soon back to that. But also other situation, functional situation like eating disorder, metabolic disorder, uh, age-related uh, changes in the pulses of the degenerate, um, and uh, also uh, what we call functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. For example, patients who overexercise uh, will have a situation like that. Uh, organic situation, uh, also acquired situation like tumors, radiotherapy, uh, surgery, or any gland uh, trauma. Now here you can see the LH level in the blue line in a uh, natural cycle. And uh, the black line is uh, now antagonist uh, use cycles. And this is the long agonist use cycle. So you see in the long agonist, cycle, you will be, have uh, levels of LH which are below uh, at the level of a so-called hypogonadotropic hypogonadism situation, but also with the antagonist, you might drop to very low levels uh, of uh, uh, LH. And in the antagonist, uh, the reason is uh, that after a pulse of uh, the antagonist, uh, we usually have a recovery of about 50% uh, of the, of the pulse, uh, but some patients overreact and uh, this recovery doesn't occur. So it will have a very low recovery. So it will end up uh, with a very low LH levels. Again, levels which are in around the levels of somebody with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And it was uh, indeed checked in uh, this is just one of many articles that I have chosen to show you. Uh, this is an article from uh, uh, Australia. And what they did was that uh, they checked uh, the LH level one day after they started with the antagonist. And uh, they found out that uh, some patients remained with the LH level above uh, one international unit. That was the cutoff point for them. And some patients dropped less than one uh, international unit the day after antagonist started. So when you look at the outcome of the treatment, you can see the significantly lower pregnancy rate and life birth rate occurred in the group that dropped less than one. Now, in a small study that they have done internally, they added to this group of patients 75 units of LH from the first day of the treatment. And what they found out was that they could correct the situation. And uh, in uh, further cycles, the outcome was the same as the uh, control group, which did not drop less than it. They did find uh, that uh, this kind of situation, a drop of LH less than 75, uh, less than one um, international unit occurred in about half of the cycles that they were treating. So actually more than you would think uh, it will happen. And probably not all of us uh, measure LH one day after we start with antagonists, so we should not be aware of the situation. So using agonists and antagonists, as you understand, will by the, the function of the antagonists and antagonists, and some patients will uh, uh, cause an LH and FSH deficiency. But if we combine it with some other situation, for example, advanced maternal age, genetic variants of gonadotropins in the receptor, or other treatment factors, 
uh, this situation can be more exacerbated. So let's have a look at advanced maternal age. So the problem with patients with advanced maternal age is that uh, they have a decreased gonadotropin bioactivity because different isoforms, especially the LH, and they have less functional receptors, especially on the thicker cells. Also, we know that uh, they have impaired steroid genesis and they have an impaired paracrine system. So this patient have difficulties uh, to adapt to situation uh, when they are using uh, uh, gene range agonist or antagonist to adapt to the situation of the low F FSH and uh, especially the low LH. And here you can see very nicely what happens if you try uh, to correct this abnormal LH at antagonist or long agonist cycle, you just increase the dose of FSH. And this is what we do actually when we stimulate, we give not physiological uh, levels of FSH in the stimulation. Now this FSH will enhance the paracrine network uh, in the patient. And this enhancement of the paracrine network will increase the sensitivity uh, of the LH uh, uh, receptors at the, at the thicker cells. So even if the less than 1% of the receptors will be occupied, we shall still have an adequate uh, function. Now, this works very well with the younger patient, and they can adapt to the situation of the abnormally low LH. But as I told you, in the older patient, first of all, the paracrine system uh, is not uh, working correctly. Secondly, the LH um, is less bioactive, and also the um, uh, receptors on the uh, uh, thicker cells are impaired. So the advanced maternal age patient will not be able to correct the situation. Now, this patient will require a recombinant LH uh, for supplementation. And uh, studies have shown that uh, using LH in uh, this advanced maternal age group will increase the follicular angiogenesis, which is important for the growth of the follicle, improve the follicular rec recruitment, will increase the follicular maturation, but high expression of maturation markers that you can see here, but also will affect the uh, growth factors like IGF-1, FGF-2, amphiregulin, epiregulin. It is known to reduce uh, uh, apoptosis, especially of the cumulus and granulosa cells, which are important for the end maturation of the oocytes. And LH is known to enhance expression of anti-apoptotic proteins in the cells. So in a review article that uh, I was uh, one of the uh, international collaborative group, uh, we published in uh, 2018 uh, a list of uh, patient group that might uh, benefit from uh, LH. And basically we did find uh, two groups that there was sufficient evidence in the literature to support the recommendation of using uh, supplementation of LH in the stimulation protocol. So the first group were uh, patients uh, with advanced maternal age, but especially the group 35 to 39, where there was the evidence uh, that could be shown. And the second group were hyporesponder patients, which I explain you immediately, what does it mean? Now, when we look at advanced maternal age uh, and we uh, try to see uh, all patients uh, over the age of 35 compared to patients between 35 and 39. Uh, we do see differences. We don't see differences in the number of the oocyte comparing recombinant FSH monotherapy to recombinant FSH plus recombinant LH. It will not change the number. But uh, when we look at implantation rate and pregnancy rate, we can see uh, nicely scientific uh, evidence uh, in the age group 35 to 39. But if we look at the whole age group, everybody over the age of 35, we shall not see it. So what, what is the reason for, for this difference? Um, well, the reason is that the patients over the age of 40 have a very high uh, aneuploidy rate. So if you will not select now the embryos that you put back by PGTA, you just put any embryo back, you will dilute uh, the, um, the outcome of the treatment 
because of the low pregnancy rate and low implantation rate in the age group over 40, just by the situation of a nucleoide. So that's why if you look at advanced maternal age up to age of 39, where a nucleoide rate will be up to about, let's say 15 or 20%, uh, then you can see a benefit. Uh, this age group over 40 will have a benefit as well. Uh, but uh, you, you will not see it in the scientific work because it will be diluted because of the anoplodity rate. And uh, starting point of a LH uh, in supplementation of advanced maternal age, uh, again, uh, some studies uh, did show that there was a benefit. Some studies did not show that there was a benefit. One of the main difference between the studies was uh, the starting point of a late. Some started on the first day and some started on the sixth day. Now, I told you at the beginning of my um, lecture that starting on the first day is important. So this study, the persist study, compared patients starting with the late on day one to starting on day six. And this were advanced maternal age uh, patient. And uh, as you can see, if you start on day uh, one, you will have significantly higher pregnancy rate and ongoing pregnancy rate compared to those who will start on day six. Because all the effect which is important in the first day by the LH via the androgens on the granulosa cells is missing in this group. And that's why you have a difference in the outcome. So to suggest uh, using recombinant LH is always to start on first day uh, of the stimulation. Now let's go back to the hyporesponder patients. So here you can see two patients with the same uh, antral follicle count, have the same reserve, uh, and uh, with the same stimulation, this group will end up with about 80% mature follicles, and this only with 30% mature follicles, which means that the follicle output rate, which is called FORT, is good here, but bad here. So this means that uh, this patient have a different sensitivity to the FSH and uh, have probably um, a deficiency uh, in LH. We can also use now a new uh, index, which is called the follicle to oocyte index. And here you should have at least 50% of your starting follicles uh, ending up with oocytes. Uh, if you will have a lower than that, then you have a low index and again, it shows a different sensitivity uh, uh, to the stimulation. Now, the reason for the different sensitivity, as I told you before, might be because polymorphisms of the FSH or the LH molecule, the so-called beta variants, or polymorphism of the FSH and LH receptors. And it has been shown that patients who have this hypo response, usually you will see this patient in your treatment uh, that the follicle grows uh, up to 10 millimeters and then you have a stagnation in the growth of the follicle and uh, you will have also on very low estradiol levels. 60% of these patients uh, will have a polymorphism uh, homozygote for serine serine at the uh, FSH receptor 680. And uh, this will cause this hypo response to the normal stimulation. In, uh, Normal population, it's only about 20, 25% of the um, group of uh, your patient that will have this. But uh, this is very high in this hyporesponder patient. Uh, they will need a higher uh, stimulation with FSH, but also addition of LH in order to reach the adequate and the same number of mature follicles and oocyte as the white type or the heterozygote type. And the same situation when you have uh, a uh, uh, polymorphism of the LH molecule, which is one of the most common ones, uh, the beta variant, about 15% of the patients are carriers. And uh, also in your country, in India, it will be probably more or less the same. So one in six patients, uh, you will have a problem with this uh, LH variant, which again, will need more stimulation and uh, higher stimulation with FSH and addition of LH. 
And uh, uh, looking at uh, the latest uh, review and systematic review and meta-analysis just published last year, uh, you can see that if you choose this kind of patients who are hyporesponders and supplement them with uh, recombinant LH, uh, you will see that you will have an increase uh, in the implantation rate and increase in the clinical pregnancy rate. So what about a uh, poor responder patient? Uh, in the past, there have been several meta-analyses to show that uh, poor responders by addition of uh, supplementation of LH uh, will have an uh, at least increase by one O site. Uh, this uh, study called the SPART study uh, at about 1,000 patients aligned to the Bologna criteria uh, randomized monotherapy with FSH or FSH LH2 to 1 showed that there was no difference in the number of oocytes. But in the severe group of the uh, poor ovarian response group, so these are the more advanced maternal age patients, you will see a lower pregnancy loss if you use recombinant LH and a higher life birth rate uh, in the group using recombinant LH, which means that you will not increase the number of the oocytes but you increase the quality and the competence of the oocyte. And also a later study published also last year showed that also the cumulative life birth rate in this moderate and severe subgroups of the Bologna criteria will benefit uh, from uh, uh, addition of LH compared to FSH monotherapy uh, concerning uh, cumulative life birth rate. Nowadays, we can also use the Poseidon subgroup uh, 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 stratification. And uh, as you can see, group one and group two in Poseidon, just to remind you, are hyporesponder patients. They have adequate uh, uh, ovarian reserve, uh, but they end up with either a very low or a suboptimal number of oocytes. Uh, group three and four are patients with low reserve, so they are expected to have a low number of oocytes. These are young patients and these are advanced maternal age patients. So as I, I told you before, in hyporesponder patient, independently now from the age, uh, will benefit uh, from uh, LH supplementation. And group four will be the SPART group with a, a moderate and severe uh, situation, uh, which will benefit uh, concerning now the life birth rate and the low miscarriage rate by uh, LA supplementation. This is one of the latest meta-analyses to show you just that if you use recombinant uh, FSH alpha, uh, you will have, compared to all other uh, groups, you will have the highest uh, probability to uh, have a high number of oocytes. If you use it in combination with recombinant LH, it is not basically the number of the oocytes, but the quality of the embryos that will achieve will be higher compared to all other combination, uh, the probability of uh, reaching a pregnancy and uh, ongoing pregnancy will be the highest. So what are potential sources of LH? Uh, nowadays we can use recombinant LH, which is very pure. And you can use this as monotherapy, but you can use it also in combination of uh, recombinant FSH two to one. And you can use urinary product, uh, so, um, human menopausal gonadotropins, where you will expect to have 75 units of LH activity with 75 units of FSH. Uh, unless you uh, have a look uh, where the LH activity is coming from, and you will find out it's coming from ACG. So why do we have HCG in postmenopausal uh, uh, women's uh, urine? Well, the reason is the high purification nowadays. The LH molecule is lost. So the companies, the pharmaceutical companies will add you HCG in order to have LH activity. Now HCG and LH have the same alpha chain by, uh, but the beta chain is different because they have more glycolization with HCG. So the affinity uh, to the uh, receptor, LHCG receptor will be higher and the half-life time is, will be three to four times longer. Uh, both of them attach to the same receptor but the receptor can identify which molecule attached. And according to that, the activity over the pathways will be different. 
HCG is predominantly active via the cyclic AMP and the CREP uh, pathway. It is five more, uh, more active there than uh, LH. So um, it will have a very good pathway for steroidogenesis because this is the pathway for steroidogenesis. So we'll have high levels of estrogens if you will use it. On the other hand, we know that high levels of 16 AMP uh, are also pro-apoptotic. So ACG might be now potentially pro-apoptotic in the follicle and in the oocyte. We also know uh, from studies that uh, ACG has no activity on these two other pathways, the phosphoarc, phosphoarc. Phosphoarc and phosphoarc are important for growth differentiation and survival of the follicles. And HCG has no activity there. Uh, LH is very active on this, is less active on the cyclic AMP, but more active here. So LH is a growth differentiation and survival factor in the follicle and uh, is anti-apoptotic. HCG is steroidogenic, pro-apoptotic, and it's also known that HCG will increase uh, the expression of caspas 3 which is a pro-apoptotic enzyme in the cells. So LH and HCG are not in equivalent in uh, in vitro studies. And uh, also uh, in vivo, they have difference with because of the long half-life of HCG, it will accumulate in the system. And this accumulation will downregulate the LH receptor on the cells at least by 48 hours. So this can happen on the level of the ovaries and studies have shown that on the granulosa cells and also on the cumulus cells, there will be less uh, expression of uh, uh, receptors, which are important for the maturation. but also on the level of endometrium, uh, it will be a block of the uh, receptors for LH. And as you know, LH is important uh, also on the endometrial level for the implantation. And when we look at some of the studies, uh, you will see that uh, implantation and pregnancy rate is uh, lower if HCG was used, so in combined in an HMG product compared to recombinant LH in addition to recombinant FSH. So also in vivo, they are not equivalent. So what do we do here in Hamburg in my center? Uh, we analyze the, the group of patients that we are treating. Now we are a secondary or tertiary uh, center by now because of our longstanding reputation. So most of our patients come from other centers where they failed uh, 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 the uh, treatment. About uh, three quarters of my uh, patients are over the age of 35. And uh, we analyzed uh, the FSH or LH receptors. So about 25% of the patients have an FSH uh, polymorphism of the receptor 680 uh, homozygotes. About 15% have LH variant. And uh, if you add all of this uh, together, you will end up with about 95% of the patient needing supplementation of LH. So we decided uh, not to try to, to look for patients that, uh, that will need LH, but we shall give LH to all the patients. In Germany, there is no difference uh, between recombinant FSH, the gonal F, or the combination FSH, LH, pegovaris. It's the same price. So financially, it's not a problem. And those 5% who will not need LH will not be harmed by 75 or 150 units of LH. So therefore, just to make it simple, we are using recombinant FSH, LH, a two to one ratio. And we use now this pen, which is very effective also for the patient. It's very simple to inject but also to fine tune the dose, especially of the FSH. Uh, so the FSH uh, dose are, uh, is decided according to the age of the patient, AMH, angiol follicle count, and we check regularly for the FSH receptors and the LH receptors as you see here. And uh, all of our cycles are antagonist cycles nowadays. And uh, as you have learned before, they also might suffer for FSH and the LH uh, deficiency. And uh, we use the individualized uh, uh, antagonist cycle. So we start with the antagonist when the lead follicle is about 13 millimeters. And uh, we trigger with uh, 
two or three follicles around 70 millimeters. We look at these five days uh, from the start of the dominant follicle, and we try not to trigger before day nine of the stimulation. And nowadays we trigger all of our patients with GnRH agonists. So here you can see how we program the patient and uh, the stimulation protocol in general. If you want to learn more about this protocol, you can look at this publication uh, published in 2019 at uh, Minerva Medica, and uh, you can have all these uh, uh, pictures and the information how to use the protocol. Nowadays, uh, we transfer only one embryo uh, for all the patients, independent to the age. Uh, only very rarely it's a two embryo transfer. So about 95% of the patients receive only one embryo. So as you can see, about uh, three quarters of the patient are in this group. And this is the mean number of oocytes that we achieve with this kind of protocol. This is the maturity according to the metaphase two. Uh, this is now the mean number of embryo transfers. We transfer and now exclusively blastocysts. And uh, this is the ongoing pregnancy rate with heartbeat after transferring one blastocyst. This is the implantation rate. And this is the miscarriage rate, of course, a little bit higher in the advanced maternal age. And this is ongoing pregnancy rate. So over 12 weeks, uh, by now they're also delivered. So there's not much difference between ongoing pregnancy rate uh, over 12 weeks and delivery rate. So just to summarize, uh, it is important uh, to um, improve your ovarian stimulation outcome by using recombinant FSH with recombinant LH, especially in the subgroups when you use a combination of iatrogenic deficiency with Madeleine LH and uh, genetical polymorphisms of uh, FSH uh, molecules or receptors. Uh, you should understand that there is a difference be between recombinant LH and HCG um, on the levels uh, of uh, mediation by different pathways. And uh, as you understand that some polymorphisms of the gonadotropin and the receptor can also impair the ovarian response uh, to gonadotropins. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, by that, I would like to finish now this presentation. And uh, I hope that we can have now a very fruitful discussion on this topic or any other topic uh, that you would like uh, to discuss. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Fisher, for your wonderful lecture. And we may have questions from audience now. So, Kerala team, uh, can you go live, please? Yeah. For your wonderful lecture. And we may have questions from the <coughs> audience now. So, Kerala team, uh, can you go live, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Robert Fisher for taking us through the role of. Thank you, Dr. Abbott Fisher, for uh, taking us to the role of. Uh, FSH LH deficiency in advanced maternal age, uh, polymorphisms of FSH and LH, and iatrogenic deficiency. Uh, the, the topic is open for discussion, and uh, 
by the time I get some questions uh, to ask to you, start the ball uh, rolling. I would like to uh, ask you, we have a group of patients more than 37 years of age, uh, which very low age, which should be less than 0.5, sometimes 0.2 uh, and all, who is desperately uh, eager to have their own uh, child. So low AFC, low AMH, and uh, the group around 37, 40 years of age. What would be your protocol in this group of patients and advice to these? So that, that will be probably if we don't remember the Poseidon groups, probably belong to Poseidon group number four, which are the low reserve patients and uh, advanced maternal age. So in this patient, you should uh, use uh, um, not more than 300 units of FSH with 150 units of LH. And uh, try first with antagonist protocols. And uh, if possible, uh, try to do double stimulation. So after retrieving uh, the oocyte, after triggering with generic agonist, wait four or five days and then stimulate again just to accumulate all sides. So this will be one way. Uh, if there are pro uh, problems uh, by uh, synchronizing the follicles, this is one of the major problems in advanced maternal age and low reserve um, to synchronize. Uh, you can use estrogen, so you can use noratisterone in the luteal phase to, to synchronize the follicles. But if it doesn't work, uh, uh, then uh, it's better to use a long agonist protocol uh, for these patients. Uh, we find that uh, hardly they develop some qualities because uh, there is extremely low level of AMH which is that 0.5, sometimes 0 0.05. Those cases, uh, any other options apart from what you are told? Sorry, but I, it's very difficult to understand you. Uh, uh, the line is uh, not very... It's much lower than the Poseidon group 4. You find the image, uh, not really, it's uh, less, than point, uh, less than 1 nanogram. It goes below 0.5, sometimes even 0.2 also. And the annual follicle count is also pretty low, less than 2 or 3 follicles. In those yes, three but two, still, still the same. Still the same. The same. Still the same. And... Uh, when you lose uh, one also possibility, uh, third possibility is um, also to use uh, LH uh, priming. So you do, down, uh, you do a down regulation long agonist protocol. And before you start with your FSH LH stimulation, you do five days of 150 units of LH. This will prime the Tika cells. And then you start with your FSH LH. So we use Pergoveris. Uh, uh, 300 units and uh, continue stimulating. You might have sometimes one egg more, but the quality of the oocyte is much better if you do this priming of five days LH before. So we have a question coming from Kolkata. Uh, what's the role of doing baseline progesterone when we are doing going for frozen transfer? So, Dr. Know from Calcutta, what's the role of doing the baseline progesterone estimation when we are doing the frozen embryo transfer? So, uh, during the frozen embryo transfer, you mean? Yeah. Uh, is it, uh, uh, you mean in uh, HRT uh, cycles or natural cycles? Details are not known. The question asked is uh, what's the role of doing the baseline progesterone? When we are doing normally, we do the progesterone the time of transfer. That's all. Uh, you you want to make sure that you don't have elevated progesterone uh, because uh, that might uh, differ the implantation window. So that's why you need uh, to to understand that when you want to start, if you are in a uh, HR, HRT uh, treatment, that before you start your progesterone, uh, the pro progesterone level is low, that the patient did not have an ovulation or have a permanent high progesterone because then the implantation window will be impaired uh, in that patient. So we have another question coming from Calcutta. Uh, why injection recombinant FSH recombinant LH 
to be given in the morning as shown in your slide? Well, the reason we, we give it in the morning is that uh, we want at the end something like 40 hours we, without a stimulation. Uh, and there was a, a nice study coming from Canada to look at uh, the quality of the embryos that will come from all sides uh, in a different uh, between uh, the last FSH and uh, the trigger for ovulation. So they looked at 24 hours uh, 48 hours and 72 hours. And what they found out was that oocytes coming uh, from uh, cycles were uh, about 48 hours difference between the last uh, FSH injection and the trigger was the percentage of the uh, blastocyst was the highest, but, but that was significant. So uh, the reason is that if you continue pushing all the time with the FSH uh, uh, your stimulation, uh, you might end up with not a normal uh, uh, way uh, that uh, the end maturation of the oocytes uh, will occur. You, you keep pushing them. And uh, that's why you need to, to let the oocyte continue the end maturation by themselves. And uh, this uh, mm, is the reason because we, we give a very early in the morning the last dose and the next day when we want to trigger, uh, we don't stimulate. So at the night, late in the night when we stimulate, we have something like 40 hours. And uh, this is the reason why we do it in the morning. Uh, we have another question also. In your protocol, you mentioned that on the trigger day, you're skipping uh, Gonadotropin dose. Can you please elaborate on that? Say again, please. Uh, in your protocol, you mentioned on the trigger day that you are skipping the gonadotropin dose. <clears throat> you are avoiding gonadotropin on the day of trigger. Can you please explain <coughs> or elaborate on that? Yes, I just explained to you before. That's why we do it in the morning, so we can have this forty hours of uh, just going by itself to maturation. In uh, some patients, uh, we give LH, uh, an, an, an LH dose of 225 units, uh, just to help the end maturation. But that's still a pilot study that we are working on at the moment. There's another question asking you, what's the role of LH in different phase of the cycle and uh, how it affects the OCR? Say again, please. I, I, it was not clear. What, what is the role of LH in different phases of cycle and how it affects the OCR? Actually, that's what I uh, explained uh, uh, in, in the beginning of my cycle. So at the beginning of the cycle, LH is important uh, for an androgen production, and uh, that will increase the uh, sensitivity of the granulosa cells, FSH receptors to FSH. So it will help the recruitment and the initial growth of the follicle. From the mid uh, cycle until ovulation, after the trigger, uh, the role of LH is to reach competence of the oocyte. So granulosa cells will have also now LH receptors. Then at the mid-cycle, LH is important for triggering the ovulation and to complete the end maturation and resumption of meiosis. And in the luteal phase, LH is important for progesterone uh, production. Uh, Professor Robert Fisher, for your dual stimulation, are you giving the dual trigger also? No, no. Uh, we don't use HCG for trigger. You only use... GnRH agonists. We only use GnRH agonists. We don't use dual trigger. Do you find a combination of uh, HCG and uh, GnRH agonists gives you better yield of oocytes and better maturity? No. I have very good maturity and very good number of oocytes just by using GnRH agonists. Using HCG will impair the progesterone production and impair uh, the implantation uh, window in the endometrium if you do a fresh cycle. So it's actually not, not, not a good thing to do. 
But uh, Professor S. G. is usually given the local phase to support the local phase also. So when uh, we we give HCG to support the luteal phase, uh, if we trigger between our agonist, we start one day uh, after egg collection with 100 units of HCG. These are micro doses of HCG that we give only for nine days, every day in the morning, and uh, this is sufficient uh, to make the luteal phase, the corpora lutea, produce progesterone. So the level of progesterone is very high if you use this kind of regime and you don't need any other supplementation of progesterone, even if the patient is pregnant. So only nine days, every day, 100 units. The only limitation is if the patients will have more than 17 follicles greater than 12 millimeters at the time of egg collection. So if that is the case, we do a freeze all policy. The reason is, that if you will transfer, the patient will become pregnant. If they have more 18 or more follicles, uh, they might end up with a late onset hyperstimulation syndrome. So not early onset, but late onset, which is more difficult to handle. So in these cases, we should freeze all. But uh, if it's not the case, the patient had only eight, 10, 12, 15 follicles, we should do a fresh transfer with that policy of luteal phase support. We have a question from the audience. Dr. Sheila Balagashan wants to ask Hello. a question. Can I just ask a couple of questions? My first question is, we haven't mentioned precedent group A. So precedent group A. Excuse me, excuse me. Okay. You, are very close. you are very close to your microphone. Right. Okay. You didn't know. Precedent group 3. A woman, a less than, a younger woman with poor ovarian reserve. Precedent group 3. Am I clear? No. Proceed, no. Proceed in group three. A young woman. Group three, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, would it be to be, or do you start with FSH and add LH if required, or would you start LH in the beginning itself? So, in those group, actually, they will not need LH. You should be. Uh, because uh, if, uh, if they don't have any other polymorphism on top of that. Right. So, if it's, right. only, if it's only the low number, yeah. We can also yeah. do without LH because Absolutely. they have actually good paracrine system and the yeah. nucleoid yeah. rate of the oocyte is very high. So mm -hmm. you don't need so many oocytes. Don't usually, exactly. But if these patients uh, show on top of that a hypo response, exactly. uh, then uh, they will need LH supplementation. So after day five, you would add LH if needed. No, 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 no. From the first day, then you have to do no, no, no. I'm asking you, it's just still, it's in the, that particular cycle. A patient, you find a high cycle. If you find out that they are stagnating, yeah. then you have to give That's 150 it. units okay. of it. Right. Okay. If she's not pregnant in that cycle, the next cycle, you have to give right. from the first day. Yeah, obviously. Then she goes into the hyper response. Procedure one, isn't it? Right. One more question. Uh, Procedure group one. Yes. Unexpected hyper response. Yeah. Sometimes some of the patients with, you know, hyper responders, when the image is high also, they sometimes come into this group. Do they? A patient with a, you know, a high AMH, it may come in procedure group one, can it? So do you think which polymorphisms are responsible, FSH or more of LH polymorphisms? In hyper responder, actual hyper responder, with an AMH of, you know, four or five or whatever, but she comes in, she's having a hyper response. Yeah. So mostly it is an FSH uh, receptor 680. Right. This is the most common. This is the most common one. Uh, but uh, they can also have uh, LH, LH uh, 312, 312, uh, heterozygotes. Uh, they, they are also hyper responders. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, uh, they can also have LH. LH uh, can they, yes, can, they LH can have the, So those those girls would require those women would require LH, high LH, isn't it? Next time, yeah, thank yeah. you, yeah. thank you very much. Yes, and they might also inquire if they have an FSH receptor polymorphism. Also, you need to increase the FSH. FSH. Units. Okay, thank you, thank you. Doctor Robert Fisher. When doing single blastocyst uh, transfer in all age groups, are you doing PGDA for all patients? 
No, in, Ger in Germany, we are not allowed to do PGTA. Uh, so what we do in advanced maternal age, so these are patients over the age of 38, uh, we do polar body uh, genetic testing for first and second polar body, also with uh, NGS. And uh, then we only use uh, embryos where the oocyte uh, was euploid. So uh, in advanced maternal age, the biggest problem is actually the oocyte, not, not the sperm or not the postmitotic uh, cases. This will only cover about 15% of uh, uh, abnormal embryos, but about 85% of abnormal embryos are because of the oocyte. So uh, that's why we do polar body genetic testing. And uh, then we just use uh, euploid oocytes, uh, 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 first and second polar body, yeah. Yeah, there's a question from Calcutta. Uh, while choosing long protocol for patients over the age of 40 years, uh, would it be detrimental because of the acquired LH deficiency? Long protocol for patients more than age of 40 years. Is it going yes. to be detrimental? Yes, uh, when we use that, we, we, you, you should give a recombinant LH in, in those patients. Uh, they, they will definitely require, yeah. Another question also from Calcutta. Having a gap of 40 hours from FSH trigger, uh, are you worried about the estradiol drop? Sorry, say again. A gap of 40 hours from FSH trigger. FSH uh, trigger. What the uh, gap is actually yeah. 40 hours is on chocolate. That's what he meant. 40 hours from maybe uh, Without, uh, you mentioned in your slide 40 to 44 hours after the last dose of gonadotrophin, isn't it? Because you might skip the gonadotrophin on the day of trigger, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's what Are you worried about the E2 drop? No, no, there, there is no E2 drop. It, it will uh, keep rising. Yeah. Okay. Question from uh, Trivander. More clinicians are going for fresh transfers in antac cycles. What are your strategies to improve clinical pregnancy rate in fresh transfer of antac cycles? So, uh, as I told you before, uh, uh, in antagonist cycle, uh, when we trigger, we trigger a lot of them with GnRH agonists, so we are not afraid of early uh, hyperstimulation syndrome. But uh, the, uh, it will be cases well uh, they have more than 17 follicles greater than 12 millimeters at the time of a collection, then we do a freeze-all policy. And uh, we use uh, micro doses of HCG for the luteal phase. That's the only luteal phase support for for nine days. And uh, for uh, repeated uh, implantation failure, uh, we shall uh, uh, use uh, uh, the error test, actually the error trio test to check for the implantation fenster uh, window and uh, the microbiota. And in those patients, we shall do a frozen embryo, elective frozen embryo transfer according to the information of the uh, ERA test. So you do a personalized embryo transfer. Uh, so nine days. Sorry? Let me see, all your cycles are uh, now against trigger alert. You have done away with the HCG triggers. Sorry again, say again. All your attack cycles, you are going ahead with the against triggers alone. Not oh, can I just... at all. No, I so we, we trigger with GnRH agonist and we trigger when we have two or three follicles of at least 17 millimeters. We don't wait longer. I mean, just make sure that it's uh, not before day nine of the stimulation. And we just make sure that we have the five days from uh, the point where the follicle, uh, the lead follicle reach dominance. So just to make sure that we have competent or all sides. So these and are the criteria. Just, so can I just, yeah. Support, yeah, the same thing. Only, uh, HCG, low dose HCG or you are, are you adding progesterone as well? Exactly. When you, for an, you said you would give an agonist trigger. 
and continue with micro dose micro hcg for 9 days is that yeah. in addition to the progesterone or no 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 progesterone no progesterone at all so then why only 9 so yeah. we oh, 9 days till the day of blastocyst trans for 9 days okay so 9 yeah. days just micro hcg How much? Before. What would be your dose? What would be your dose from which day? From the day of trigger? No, from no. the day of transfer. Uh, OCR. So if you let me explain. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, we we studied a few patients. We checked every second day the blood results, mm -hmm. and we found out that uh, at day nine, uh, those patients who become pregnant. So the base level that you can measure in uh, the serum. Uh, of uh, hcg if you give 100 units it's uh, between 5 and 6 mill international unit per milliliter now if you measure on day 9 altogether 12 or 15 units of hcg it means that the embryo it's implanted pregnant. now the embryo is producing now more than what you are giving from outside so there is no need to continue giving from outside that's why we stop and if the patient is not pregnant on day 10 then uh, she will okay. not be pregnant anymore okay. uh, so, so start date start, of, uh, start date of uh, this uh, micro dose of hcg when will you start micro dose of hcg when will you start one day after a collection 24 hours after a collection 24 hours after so no progesterone at all nothing nothing you will have very high levels of progesterone So the mean levels that oh. we are measure is between oh. 150 and 200 uh, nanograms per milliliter progesterone. When? The level of progesterone from corpus luteum is very high. When? Okay. Which day would that level? Which day are you talking about? That, that level will be at the mid uh, um, uh, the implantation day. Uh, okay. At day, uh, 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 at collection plus I seven. Plus seven. Okay. Yes, and it, it goes up slowly as like the natural cycle. So on day of a collection, we have only four nanograms <laughs> per milliliter, and then it continues going up. So at day five, you will have something like 120 nanograms per milliliter. So there is no product you, you will use that you can reach levels like that. And the dose of HCG is 100. to induce both fsh and lx surge yeah. now we are saying no fsh before the trigger so if we use gnrs trigger is it the same if we use hcg trigger also so if you use gnrs uh, agonist trigger you have also an fsh surge by itself this is physiologic this is what happens in a normal uh, trigger also you have an fsh surge If you only use HCG, uh, that then you will not have an FSH surge. You have no FSH. FSH is important uh, for the end maturation, and uh, that's why it's the benefit of using GnRH agonists. So some pay, uh, some people use HCG plus 450 units of FSH. Some other will use uh, GnRH plus uh, HCG, but I think uh, this is not uh, necessary because you can make it. you just complicate you can use it simple just use gnrh agonist and it's much cheaper and you have the same result so probably even better than if you are having hcg involved what best better lady what will be your ideal uh, stimulation protocol is it an agonist or an antagonist which you prefer we we usually start with the antagonist protocol we use a uh, noradrenaline to priming uh just to program and that will low down also the pituitary so uh, you can have a better synchronization now if uh, uh, repeatedly the patient will not perform well on the antagonist protocol uh then we switch to long agonist protocol
Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. You said agonist protocol for proceeding group four. Do you have any lower limit for the AMH? Or if, if she doesn't respond to the ANTAG, proceeding group four? Uh, so, what uh, we, we always try, if you can see a few antral follicles, the beginning yeah. to stay. If, if we find out that if we stimulate the patient, we only end up with one follicle right. in repeated stimulation, and then we change. Uh, to a natural cycle, uh, a, a modified natural cycle. So we wait until a lead follicle is about 14 millimeters. Then we start with antagonists plus uh, we give pergovaris 150 units and uh, then uh, we trigger for ovulation after two or three days. Stop simulation. So, uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, how good are you on time now? Because we are uh, at the end of our session. Yes, we, we are at... Uh, I'm not sure if you have more questions or... Uh, Jack Christian, sir, uh, any questions from Kerala? Kerala team? Kerala, I think one more question is there. Uh, what is your view on the raised progesterone level of the day of your cycles? Do you still believe that it is going to affect the implantation? Uh, yes, uh, it, it will affect your implantation, um, and uh, that's why you should do a uh, free zone. Now, if you will use uh, FSH or H221, the pergovaries, you will rarely see a uh, progesterone elevation, um, because uh, this has been also shown in uh, one paper from Fertility and Sterility, that in this combination of 221 FSH to LH, uh, it's very rare to see a uh, progesterone elevation on the day of the trigger. So uh, this is one benefit uh, on, on, on the side by using FSH to LH. But we are seeing uh, with FSH LH also, we are seeing raised uh, progesterone. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the, the reason is if, if, you will, if you are waiting too long with your trigger, uh, then, then you will have, you start having a luteinization. Uh, so that's why you should trigger when you have Two to three follicles at 17 millimeters. You should yeah. not wait yeah. longer. So our parameters are almost the same. 17, 18, we actually go for the okay. trigger, but still we find the raised progesterone uh, yeah. in this. No, for in my center, and we do about uh, 1,500 fresh cycles uh, every year, uh, maybe one or two cases a year that I can see. So it's, it's very rare. Very rare. Do you give growth hormone for proceeding group four? Sorry? Uh, adjuvants, growth hormone. What is the place of, are you, ad, are you giving growth hormone? No, no, we are not giving because we are still waiting to see what uh, the, yeah, the, the latent RCT is going on. It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And the only cases I gave in the past were patients with growth hormone deficiency. Where I, by clonidin test, I could prove that they have a growth hormone deficiency and they benefited from growth hormone. Otherwise, I'm still waiting to see the evidence, okay. and there is no enough evidence. Not yet. enough. Any other adjuvants you are giving? Sorry. Any 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 other adjuvants you are giving? Trying for this. Any other no, adjuvants? Uh, adjuvants. Uh, add-ons. Add add any add-ons other than growth hormone? Uh, one second, please. No, 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 any other adjuvants. Um, I no, think I, I will know. need to finish now because the patient starts to get impatient. Uh, they, I need to start my clinic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a question from Calcutta. Again, they are, they are repeating the same question, I presume. Uh, they are asking trigger should be only by GnRH against an ovarian stimulation with recombinant FSH and LH. Or you follow <coughs> the same trigger injection for all stimulation protocols. I use it for low stimulation protocols because I believe that there is a benefit by using GnRH agonist. And uh, that's that's why we use it for everybody. And uh, but uh, everybody needs to decide for themselves. It's, it's not obligatory to, to use GnRH agonist if you use recombinant FSH and LH, but I think for, for any stimulation you use, if you use GnRH agonist, the, the, you, you have at the back of your 
uh, on, on uh, it's written even so we know ART is not natural we can learn from nature to optimize our approach so uh, the ovulation trigger in the natural cycle is not HCG it's uh, LH so and FSH so that's why we, we try to, to mimic the nature I, I think finish now because I'm getting in yeah. trouble yeah. Is that, uh, yes, yes. So, uh, Jagatin sir, I think uh, uh, Professor Fisher has to start his clinic, so we will uh, okay. conclude now. So, I'd like to thank uh, Robert Fisher on behalf of the uh, <coughs> Kerala and as well as the Calcutta group. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your ideas and thoughts. It is very thought provoking. Thank you very much. Thank you, and hope to see you soon. Yeah. Also, thank you, thank you, Dr. Fisher, you. for your uh, lecture and for uh, addressing all questions. Allow to despite uh, we are despite going about the time. Thank you very much for joining. And also thank you, Dr. Jack Christian, sir, for his presence and uh, chilling of session from Kerala. Uh, thank you, sir. And last but not least, we are, we'd like to thank all the participants joined from uh, Kerala live, Dr. Rohit and his team, and all doctors from uh, Kolkata, and all, all participants who have joined online on a working day for making this success, uh, even successful one. Thank you very much once again. Uh, we conclude now. Have a nice evening.